Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shah, for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to come over here. Uh, the temperature is uh, make me feel like at home with Chicago, so thank you. Um, today we'll talk about uh, diseases that normally are not very uh, exciting because uh, that for many, many years there's not been really a lot to do with them. Uh, although they are pretty common, and then they're like, uh, I'm sure that most of you have seen patients with uh, uh, either polycythemia vera or, or essential thrombocytemia. Um, a few conflicts of interest, I have uh, research funding and some advisory board fees. So we talk about these uh, categories of uh, diseases that the WHO uh, in, in 2008 put together in the myeloproliferative neoplasm uh, before they were called disorders, now neoplasm. And uh, the big finding was actually in uh, a few years ago when uh, in 2005, three different groups at the same time published the discovery that a mutation of JAK2 gene uh, was related uh, and very common in patients with polycythemia vera. Uh, actually, almost 90% of the patients with polycythemia vera have a mutation uh, of the JAK2 gene. At the time, the excitement was very high because people were thinking that actually JAK2 was uh, the same as BCR able for CML, so you know, if we find something that will target the JAK2 mutation, then we're done. Um, from a diagnostic purpose, uh, also, it changed the discovery, it changed uh, the criteria for diagnosis of these diseases. In, uh, in polycythemia vera, um, as you see, there are like major criteria with hemoglobin and uh, uh, red cell volume, but the, the presence of JAK2 mutation or other markers actually that are increasing uh, very rapidly is part of the diagnostic uh, process. And this is true also for essential thrombocythemia, which is another clonal disease. These are chronic uh, cancers of the bone marrow, uh, of the myeloid component of the bone marrow. Um, so the bone marrow biopsy is important, but it's not really sufficient to diagnose these diseases. Uh, in essential thrombocythemia, uh, we, we you do with the bone marrow, patients have a high number of platelets, which actually could happen for many different reasons, but the bone marrow can show some uh, proliferation of enlarged megakaryocytes. So histology is, is important, and uh, as probably the, 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 whoever is in, in pathology knows, uh, but very often is not really that clear cut that, I mean, our reports are always consistent with different things. The presence of a mutation or a, of a genetic mutation in the standard diagnostic process is very, very helpful. And of course, also for myelofibrosis, uh, uh, the same thing. Uh, myelofibrosis has, of course, the, the, the finding of, of fibrosis, but the fibrosis, you can find it in, in, in many different diseases. And so again, uh, and I'll show you in a minute a few new findings that have been very, very helpful. And now I think we can find a, 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 set, a, a genetic abnormality in, in over 90% of the patients, even with myelofibrosis. The JAK2 mutation or, has been, as I said before, very interesting because what happens basically, JAK2 is, is, is downstream of many receptors for cytokines. In particular, pretend this is like the erythropoietin receptor in a polycythemia vera patient. Uh, with a JAK2 mutation, the receptor uh, uh, is activated because JAK2 is mutated in the absence of the erythropoietin on the top of the receptor. So the receptor does not need to be activated by a cytokine. It's already on, on its own. So it continues to, to stimulate uh, to the nucleus uh, the signal through STAT uh, uh, pathway to proliferate. So the red cells will proliferate in the absence of erythropoietin. And that will be always an on signal with no turning off uh, mechanism. As I said, JAK2 has been one, but uh, now more and more we have more mutation that we can look at. Uh, MPL and uh, JAK2 uh, exon 12 mutation have been uh, discovered in, in, uh, in essential thrombocytemia, in malafibrosis, or in polycythemia, but there are now many more which are, have become discovered not only in these diseases, but also in other disorders, especially myeloid disorders, like uh, epigen what we are called epigenetic mutations. Um, I will not spend more time on this, but this is in this table. You see it actually uh, across the many diseases. You find that uh, besides the JAK2 mutation, the, which we know, uh, the TET2 mutation or uh, um, SLX1 or uh, IDH1 or IDH2, these are common, are now being discovered in, in many diseases. 
including the AML and MDS. However, the JAK2 mutation has also been become very helpful in the in the diagnostics process. And this is actually a slide that I, I show many times to the uh, very often to the to our residents and, and fellows, because you can make a diagnosis of patient of a patient with polycythemia vera almost based on a very simple algorithm like this where you, you can uh, request uh, the JAK2 mutation test as long as, uh, and with, together with the erythropoietin level. So no bone marrow, you have a patient who has actually 18 gram of hemoglobin, and you send the, the labs for a, a JAK2 mutation and EPO level, and if, if their JAK2 is positive and the EPO level is low, then you're done. You don't really need more than that to diagnose a polycythemia error patient. Uh, if the JAK2 mutation is positive and the erythropoietin level is normal, uh, it's still very likely that, that that's still a polycythemia vera patient. And sometimes, depending on the age, we, we may do a bone marrow to confirm it, but it's very, very highly uh, like, it's very likely that it's going to be a, a PV patient. Uh, on the other side, if the JAK2 mutation is negative, as I said, 90% of the patients have a JAK2 mutation, so 10% of the patient may be negative. And if it's negative, but the erythropoietin is low, it's hard to, dis to, to understand why if someone would have, like someone, a, a smoker, or someone with a, a, a lung problem, uh, would have a very low erythropoietin level uh, and, 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 and 18 grams of hemoglobin. So it's still impossible. So we, we, we do the bone marrow, we look for other mutation in that case. Um, there's also a possibility of a congenital uh, disease, but it's still a highly uh, suspicious case. And lately, and, and lastly, if the JAK2 mutation is negative and the erythropoietin level is, is, is elevated, then it's very unlikely that that patient will have a, a polycythemia or PV. As I said, the erythropoietin level is important because another test that we, we sometimes we do, you send the bone marrow to the lab and then they can culture the bone marrow cells in vitro in, in the lab without adding anything to the culture. And if you grow red cell colonies there, that's, that means actually the patient has PV because the bone marrow otherwise would necessarily require that we add some erythropoietin level to the culture in order to grow uh, red cells. So the EPV patient have a, what they call endogenous uh, erythroid colonies, uh, which is a, almost a, a very sensitive uh, test. Now the new finding in model fibrosis and, and the essential, essential thrombocytemia came out uh, a few months ago, or last, uh, last year, well, there's a new mutation uh, that's been discovered, calreticulin mutation, uh, that is mutual exclusive um, with the uh, JAK2 mutation. And uh, in the ET and PV patients, ET and, and malafibrosis patients, as you can see here, um, almost 70, 80% of the patients who do not have the JAK2 mutation have a calreticulin mutation. So between these two tests, you can actually have it, uh, uh, you, you diagnose almost 90% uh, of the patients, 80 to 90% of the patients uh, with calreticulin. In the study in the New England Journal, actually, they, they, the author showed, it was an European uh, study between a group from Italy, a group from Austria, uh, where they showed that not only it's, it's the, the mutations can be different, but also that it is a protective mutation, that actually the patients with, who have a calreticulin mutation have a better uh, outcome than, than uh, those who do not have it. How we treat these diseases? So there's not really a lot uh, really for treatment of, the, of these patients. We have some standard, though, some, uh, some gold standard that we want to, to make sure that we, we do. Uh, like, for example, in polycythemia, we are patients, every patient should be on aspirin unless the patient is on anticoagulation for other issues. So aspirin, no matter what, no matter what the, the, the age, no matter what the hematocrit, no matter what, uh, should be a, a low dose aspirin, 81 milligram aspirin should be given to any PV patient. Uh, this was demonstrated years ago um, to be, uh, to prolong the, the event free survival. Um, we always knew that the hematocrit should be below 45, but there was not, there's never been a demonstration, a formal demonstration until last year when, um, again, a European study showed that uh, patients with a hematocrit below 45 by means of uh, hydroxyurea or phlebotomy have a significant reduction in, uh, in cardiovascular deaths or uh, in vein thrombosis. And so what we thought it was 
standard, it is standard. And actually, in some cases, especially in women, we, we target the 43 of him or, or uh, rheumatocrit, but 45 is necessary, is definitely a target that we want to have for every patient uh, with polycythemia every year. High risk, so essential thrombocytemia is a much different uh, story. So we, in Chicago, as you know, we have uh, our, our backyard is, is Mayo Clinic. And so uh, many, many patients who, who are in Chicago, they go to Mayo Clinic for a second opinion, uh, or, they have, or even if they are not from Chicago, Mayo Clinic is, and I've seen many, many patients, just to give you an idea, because uh, uh, who are referred there, but then they are not happy about that because the, the well, but it's also what we do, and they come out for, to us for a second or third opinion. A patient with that, if you see a patient, a, a, a 51 years old uh, woman, uh, without any history of thrombosis, and um, um, with uh, 1.2 million platelets, um, we would not do anything to this person, to this, to this patient. We would not give her aspirin. Uh, we will not give a madria. We will not give any, any treatment. There's no data to show that a patient with essential thrombocythemia should be treated with uh, a, a hydroxyurea, an agrolide, or any chemotherapy to lower the number of platelets unless she has high risk factors. And the only high risk factors are age, uh, above 60 years of age, or the history of previous thrombosis. Uh, the common practice is that is actually most of these patients come to us and they have been already on, um, on aspirin, especially, a lot, uh, and m most of them also already on, on hydroxyurea. And this makes the doctors very happy and, and safer. They think, well, I'm, I'm doing something. But it's not actually some of these patients bleed. Uh, you know, the platelets of these patients are not functional all the time. So the standard, actually, there's no guideline to, 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 to treat patients uh, with a million platelets unless they have risk factors or uh, you know, other risk factors for thrombosis. Uh, it could be uh, diabetes or obesity or cholesterol levels, and, but otherwise. However, in high risk patients, is absolutely necessary. I mean, as was demonstrated years ago, and it says it's very important to keep the platelets below for 450,000. The, the number was lowered a few years ago. It, was, it used to be 600,000, and now we keep it at 450. So for patients at high risk, uh, we, do our, we have an aggressive uh, approach in trying to keep the platelets lower. Now, the JAK2 mutation, as I said before, the excitement was uh, many, many, com many drug companies, many hedge funds, many people, investors, threw a lot of money into discover, to discover the new Glivec, uh, the new drug that would target the JAK2 mutation and cure these patients. And, uh, and in fact, though, as you can see here, the pathway for the JAK2, the JAK2 is not the only one that actually affects the, the cells. And in fact, uh, the results have been disappointing for those investors because uh, the JAK2 the JAK2 inhibitor. There's one JAK2 inhibitor uh, that is uh, FDA approved for malafibrosis only so far, which is ruxolizumab. Uh, what has shown though this 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 JAK by blocking the JAK gene, and this is a JAK uh, not JAK2 uh, inhibitor, it's a JAK1, 2, and 3 uh, inhibitor. Uh, the clone does not respond. We cannot block the, the, the clone, the malafibrosis. But what these drugs do, as that was shown in the New England Journal a few years ago, they shut down a lot of cytokines because JAK2 is downstream of, a many, of, a, of the receptors of many cytokines. By doing that, in malafibrosis patients where the clinical feature is often characterized by splenomegaly, by constitutional symptoms like uh, weight loss, uh, low grade fever, pain, um, these symptoms in many of these patients stop very quickly in a, in a, in a week or two. And this was a, was a dramatic finding, and, uh, and, and uh, it definitely improved, uh, improves the quality of life of this patient uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a significant way, in a dramatic way. So the, the, the improvement of the constitutional symptoms uh, and the, the reduction of splenomegaly uh, made the FDA approve this, uh, the, the use of this drug in malafibrosis. Uh, these drugs have been now been tested also in PV and in ET patients. And you, here you see a list of many uh, um, new products that are not yet approved in different stages of, of uh, clinical trial. I think the Rixolinib uh, has completed, actually, I think the data will be presented at ASH in, in the next month, the phase three study in PV and in ET. Uh, 
and uh, it's possible that actually that, that the drug will be approved also in these diseases very soon. These are the results of the phase two study of erythrocytinib that were presented at ASH uh, a, a couple of years ago, and there's a, a complete and partial response in these patients, so the number of platelets and, and the hematocrit also respond to the treatment of, of this drug. The splenomegaly again, and, and you see the, the, the improvement on the uh, constitutional symptoms, the pruritus for, for PV patients, uh, night sweats, you know, if you treat these patients, some of these patients are doing okay. However, they tell you, you know, doctor, you know, the night sweats killed me, and the, uh, every time I take a shower, I start scratching, and it's, so it's gonna be a very meaningful thing, a uh, type of treatment for quality of life purposes. A very fascinating drug that's been tested is the pegylated interferon. I mean, as you know, interferon has been around for a thousand years. Um, in many diseases, it was a treatment of choice for CML in the past, is a treatment for, for hepatitis, has been uh, utilized in, in different uh, settings. The pegylated uh, uh, formulation of, of interferon is much better tolerated by the patient. And uh, there were a couple of studies where they actually showed a, a very surprising response in PV and in ET patients, achieving a, a complete response in over 70% of the patients. And uh, uh, so there is not yet a, a, a final study, a randomized study, but there is a randomized study uh, being um, done in the United States and in Europe with, with uh, pegylated inter within the MP, MP, MPD research consortium, where a randomized study for patients newly diagnosed or, or with three months of diagnosis uh, with PVNET to randomize a drug urea and pegylated interferon. And that will tell, tell us if actually pegylated interferon should be the first line therapy, because it's definitely a very good second line therapy. Uh, the interesting thing actually that pegylated interferon has been the only one so far to demonstrate uh, even molecular responses uh, in these diseases. Even the JAK2 mutation can be brought to a complete response. And it was also shown that actually the people, the patients who do not respond, do not achieve a molecular response, is because they develop other uh, mutations that will uh, limit the effect of the uh, interferon. Monofibrosis, as I said before, is a disease that can be diagnosed. Uh, uh, sometimes many diseases have to have fibrosis in the bone marrow, uh, from hairy cell leukemia, metastatic cancer, uh, lupus, uh, pulmonary hypertension. So the diagnosis has been always a challenge. Uh, there's also an entity called pri um, early primary fibrosis, um, which actually is a disease where the bone marrow has very small amount of fibrosis, and you see a lot of megakaryocytes. So it's like a pre-fibrotic phase of malofibrosis versus essential thromocythemia. I know that I'm sure that many pathologists actually struggle with that all the time. They want a lot of information from the doctors because it's hard to know. Um, there was a study published a couple of years by John Barosi, uh, who showed actually the, the outcome of patients with the pre-fibrotic myelofibrosis is much better, so it's at an early stage of disease. And so this, when you diagnose that kind of disease, it's a good news for the patient. Um, Malofibrosis is also very common to, to have extra medullary sites. Uh, this is actually a patient of ours that we, we, tell, we looked at the, the, at the lung uh, in patients who were going to transplant and we found nodules. And so we thought they were lung cancer, we biopsied the nodules. And actually this, you can find a, a nice uh, picture of hematopoiesis in the alveolar tissues uh, like this. There's a lung biopsy and then you see the marrow um, the cells. Uh, the prognosis of, of myelofibrosis depends on, uh, today we have uh, five major criteria, which are age, the presence of symptoms, the hemodyanemia, uh, the white cell count, and the, and the number of, uh, and the presence or not presence of blasts in the peripheral blood. These five factors uh, uh, created a score, which is an IPS score, uh, and if, if, if you are in the low grade, so no, none of these five symptoms, the survival is over 10 years. Uh, if you have uh, three or more of these of this, uh, criteria, the survival is, is less than two years, or about two years. So you see there's a big difference in the outcome of these patients, and to identify the criteria to select possible treatments is very important. Uh, this IPSS score has been further modified by uh, adding uh, different things. One is the, 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 the value of the hemoglobin of the anemia is more important than the other, so it actually gets double points. But also now people are trying to add other cytogenetics and the, uh, the platelet transfusion or um, 
so it, it's, it's, it's more complicated. But I think the, 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 what we call a dynamic IPSS is a, is a prognostic score that applies to any time, any moment of the, of the story of the patients, not only a diagnosis. And that actually has been very helpful because the next point is how do we treat these patients? Um, you know, until before, before we had the JAK2 inhibitors, the people would juggle with the uh, androgens, uh, thalidomide, hydroxyurea, uh, busulfan, 2CDA actually has been some, in some uh, experience at, at Mayo Clinic helpful, uh, splenic radiation, all these things I think have, people have tried anything, but none of these treatment actually really affects the outcome of the patients or improves their survival. The JAK2 inhibitor, big studies in, the, in randomized fashion, uh, there are a couple of papers in the England Journal of Medicine, has shown in a randomized study, they did a, a best uh, uh, um, available treatment versus uh, JAK2 inhibitor, rixolinib, and they showed actually the people who got the JAK2 inhibitor had a much better outcome in terms of quality of life in the splenomegaly, a reduce, a re a reduction of spleno, the splenic size, reduction of symptoms, but there's also some data that were presented, uh, actually published, uh, with some evidence of slight improvement in overall survival. And that is not likely because the, the disease is improved, has improved probably, but more because the patients have less infection, have a better quality, they eat better. Uh, these patients were cachectic and they become uh, li alive again. It's a, it's a very um, powerful way to, to improve many other aspects of, of life. Uh, there were also data that actually patients who have a better response in the splenomegaly uh, component, they have a, a, apparently a better survival as well. However, and actually, and then you see here, as I said before, uh, there are other drugs coming, uh, coming along. Uh, different companies have produced, are, are, are close to introducing the market uh, other JAK inhibitors that are slightly different from each other. Uh, the major claim is, is to have uh, less toxicity. The major toxicity of these drugs actually is, is thrombocytopenia. Um, so, uh, but the issue, the issue is actually everybody will try to find the, the market uh, niche for, for them. But none of them actually, um, let's go there. None of them actually can cure the disease. Uh, myelofibrosis is uncurable unless we try a bone marrow transplant. Now the decision is, if you have a patient at low risk, doesn't need anything. If a patient at intermediate one risk, uh, eventually, eventually would need the JAK2 inhibitor if he has a splenomegaly, or if he has a, a uh, some symptoms that really affects his life, but not much. But if you have a patient with an IPS score of two, uh, uh, intermediate two, or high risk, this patient has a survival expectancy between, between one and a half and, two, and, and four years. And so depending on the age of this patient, uh, a bone marrow transplant has been considered. Now, uh, bone marrow transplant has been applied in the past, many even 10 years ago, because it's the only, the only procedures that actually can normalize, as you can see in this light, the bone marrow. So the bone marrow patients who successfully go through a transplant becomes normal. The fibrosis go away. I'm not sure the mechanism, but it does go away. So there are many questions. Who is the candidate? What condition regimen? What donor? Uh, Splenomegaly, does it matter? The two mutation, does it matter? All these questions actually have, are, are being addressed. Most of them actually have been addressed already. Um, and first thing, actually, that we identify the patients, intermediate high risk uh, for transplant. The old studies show that when we use, uh, people use a chemotherapy for the transplant, a fully old-fashioned uh, chemotherapy, myeloblative chemotherapy transplant, the toxicity was so high that there was like a 40% mortality. And so people were not really excited about that. And these were patients in their, and these were, there were patients selected for being very young, in, the, in their 40s. So those studies were not really, never really made a big difference in the, in the, in the transplant community. Uh, and then in two, the early 2000, we and other groups uh, reported on retrospective studies on, on reduced intensity chemotherapy transplant. So the, the patient goes to a transplant with a smaller dose of chemotherapy. And patients were in their 50s. And the survival actually was much better, and actually the mortality was only 10 to 20 percent. So that be from that time, uh, the bone marrow transplant has become a standard uh, for patients at high risk or intermediate risk for mild fibrosis. But they were still all all based on, on retrospective studies. The only prospective study, uh, and this was an example, the only prospective study was uh, uh, done in Europe uh, a few years ago. 
where they, in Germany, mostly in Germany, they um, show that by using a small condition regimen with low dose resulfan fludarabine and, and ATG, uh, patients above 50 years of age uh, had a, a 50 to 70 percent survival uh, after a transplant. There was 100 patients, so that this study was a uh, has been the only one study. The, the, the only other prospective studies was done in the United States and in part in Europe that we uh, arranged, we, uh, we, we actually, the, the, the German study also showed afterwards that the patients with eject 2 mutation had a better outcome than those who, who did not have eject 2 mutation after transplant. So to, to, nobody knew if this actually was really true. There's only one study who did that. So we did the same, we, we did a, pro, a, a prospective study that we published a, a couple of months ago, uh, where we enrolled 66 patients in a prospective fashion, all patients with the intermediate high risk and who had a, a donor either a related or unrelated family member or unrelated donor but compatible. And uh, we did uh, a fludarabine malfoland regimen, so reduced intensity. And we found that was the only, that's the only US study that's been done so far prospectively. And we have shown actually that patients who have a matched sibling uh, and these are highly patient, high risk patients uh, in their mid 50s to 65, the age. Uh, they have 70% long term uh, event free survival, so cure. So we can cure 70% of the patients with myelofibrosis if they have a matched donor, a matched sibling. Uh, we did not have the same good results with unrelated donors, mostly because we had a lot of patients with the, uh, with the rejection of the bone marrow transplant but still remains uh, the only way to cure the disease. And we looked at the JAK2 mutation. We, don't really, we did not find a correlation with the, between JAK2 mutation and outcome, uh, nor the age. So even the younger and the older patient did either well or badly in the same based on the type of donor. Now, the new thing is actually people are trying to show prognostic factors, and I go back to the, uh, the caroticlin patients or the JAK2 mutation patients. Now, one of the concepts, actually, that the worst case is to have a, a, a triple negative um, JAK2, MPL, and calreticulin negative patients would have the worst outcome. Again, there's only one study, but that's where we, you know, probably going mimicking the, the, the solid tumor people. So we, we look for the triple negative as a, as a bad story. Um, and so those would be the target of, of new, uh, new therapies and, and uh, new type of transplant. Uh, the, the question now is how does a JAK2 inhibitor can be applied to the transplant? Of course, you JAK2 inhibitor, I told you, decreases the spleen, decreases the symptoms, makes the pe people feel better. Would that be the best option before the transplant? It's pro probably, there's a couple, there are now a couple of, of papers, a uh, small series of patients showing that, he's, uh, that he lo it looks good. Uh, there's not amazing results, but it, it's, it's feasible. And we are now doing a study where the patient will have three months of uh, JAK2 inhibitor prior to transplant, and then we'll see if this actually improves the outcome, especially in the unrelated setting. I think this is all, and I wanted to thank you with the Nepalese uh, pictures to remind you that our Nepalese mission. Thank you very much.